Okay, going for launch in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. This video was made possible by NordVPN. Oh dear. The last Project Air video I made showed you how I created a 3D printed rocket with interchangeable parts and systems. Certain elements of that project reminded me of a particular game that I used to be quite fond of playing from time to time. The way it was modular with interchangeable parts, the design philosophy of simply adding more engines to give you the results you want, the way the parachute failed on the very first flight, and the way it completely annihilated itself on the earliest opportunity. Look at the carnage. <laughs> This got me thinking, this is sort of like Kerbal Space Program in real life. I know that a lot of you thought this too, so I thought that what I would do is go the whole hog and design some actual Kerbal Space Program rockets to see if they work in the real world. What I've done is both mod some SDL files that I found on the internet and create some parts from scratch to allow me to fire these things with rocket motors that are commercially available. So what we'll do is design some rockets in Kerbal Space Program, bring them to life with 3D printing, and then of course go out and test them to see just how Kerbal they really are. Before getting started on this project, I thought I'd check out some early rocket designs to get some inspiration. I think it's fair to say that the early part of the space race was very Kerbal to say the least. I mean, stuff was going wrong all over the place. Look at this rocket, it actually implodes. I find it fascinating to read up on all of this stuff, and I'm sure this time inspired Kerbal Space Program somewhat. It's one reason I wanted to build all of these interesting looking Kerbal rockets, as they really capture the spirit of this pioneering time. I mean, I would be interested in this though. The reason these rockets actually existed was down to the Cold War. One purpose was to put cutting edge spy satellites into orbit. If there's one thing for sure, you don't want people spying on you. And that's why this video is sponsored by NordVPN. Today, you don't need someone to launch a rocket to spy on you and steal your data. If you want to protect yourself online, you should get NordVPN. NordVPN protects your data when traveling in public. This means that all of your details are safe and personal information can't be sold to advertisers, for instance. It uses a double data encryption to increase your anonymity online. You can connect to super fast servers in 60 countries, which allows you to do things such as unlock Netflix content that might not be available in your specific territory. Woohoo! It allows you up to six simultaneous connections and even works in China. I mean, that, that's really quite impressive. Go to nordvpn.org slash projectair to get a rather generous 70% off a three year plan with an additional month for free. Simply click the link in the description to take you there. Thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Right then, here's how I designed the first rocket on Kerbal Space Program. All right, as of this moment in time, I haven't started making any of the rockets, as in 3D printing them on the 3D printer. First of all, I'm going to start designing the rockets using Kerbal Space Program as my CAD software, which is <laughs> something I've never done. Never used a game before in my videos at all. But today, we're designing stuff in Kerbal Space Program. So, I'm going to go into the VAB, Vertical Assembly Building, and start assembling a rocket. The SDL files that this project is largely based on were created by another person on Thingiverse who, uh, who's devoted their time to recreating some of the parts in the game in real life that you can print out and create your own static models of, of whatever rockets you make. However, these files don't contain every single part in the game, so I'm going to have to be a bit selective when creating my rockets in the game to make sure I, could, I have actually got the parts in real life because I don't want to... to make new parts if I don't have to. So I'm going to start off by selecting my command module, um, the capsule here, and that's going to be the very top of my rocket. This first rocket is going to be quite simple and then we might, you know, if this project seems to work a little bit, we might develop that further on. I'm going to select a fuel tank under here. Now there is a part that I like in real life that I don't have in the game, so I'm going to make that out of a fuel tank. It's like some sort of uh, service module, I suppose you could say, that looks really cool. It's got these little fins on it, which is, uh, which probably isn't very good for getting our <laughs> centre of pressure all that low on the rocket. Uh, but yeah, 
they look cool. While I'm assembling the rest of the rocket, maybe I should explain. On rockets, you want to get the center of pressure below the center of gravity. It's a good rule of thumb when you're designing rockets. The fins on the rocket work like the fins on an arrow or the fins on a dart or something in that they stabilize the rocket. So they create a, a lower center of pressure. Whenever this, the rocket starts moving out of, out of balance or it starts rotating, the fins counteract that through the uh, aerodynamic forces inflicted on them. Having fins up here on the rocket isn't usually a good idea, um, but they look cool and they're not very big, so I'm just gonna sort of accept it. <laughs> Hopefully the relatively large fins I'm going to put on this rocket um, will counteract them anyway. Right, I'm gonna stick a massive rocket engine underneath there. I know I can print out that part or something very similar to it. I think it's changed design slightly, but whatever doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to put some fins on it, as I said. Before you comment down below saying, why don't I make a thrust vectoring system? People are already doing that on YouTube, so I'm not going to devote years of my life to perfecting a system just for this one rocket um, video that I'm doing. I might do something to do with thrust vectoring in the future. You can tell I haven't played this, <laughs> this game for a while. Um, I'm not really into games, typically. Maybe simulators and stuff I quite like, but... I prefer doing stuff in real life when it comes to messing around with rockets and, and such. Oh, I'm going to put a, to make it a bit more Kerbal-esque, I'm going to put a docking port on the top because I know that I've got one of those in real life. And then I'll put a parachute on it because obviously we're going to have a parachute on the real thing. Alright, this is the rocket that we're going to be building in real life. Um, this is, yeah, quite a simple rocket really. Looks quite cool though, I think. For this flight, um, that's a bit too close. Before this flight, I'm going to lock the gimbal on here because obviously we don't want that doing any thrust vectoring when we don't have thrust vectoring in real life. We want to simulate this as accurately as possible. And then without any stabilization, let's see how this thing flies in the game. As predicted, this thing seems to be flying quite stably, so um, that's a good sign. Yeah, not sure how that's going to compare to, to real life it's when we uh, <laughs> test the, the real life one. But it works in the game, so let's go and 3D print some parts, put them together, and then see how it flies in real life. Many of the files I had to print for this rocket helpfully could be kept exactly the same as the original parts from Thingiverse. The command parts, for instance, were kept exactly the same and printed at 20% infill. A few of the lower parts, though, had to be modified. The engine part, for instance, I wanted to use as the motor mount for an 18mm solid fuel rocket motor. After some minor tweaks to widen the lower part of the engine, I could hollow out the part on Fusion 360 so it could house the motor. To make sure the motor was secured and in the right position, I had to design a custom motor cap piece. If I leave it like this, it's just going to drop through the bottom or obviously come straight out the top when we ignite it. So I need some sort of buffer or stopper to go on the top of this. The ejection charge from the motor needs to still be allowed to come out of the top of the motor. Um, so I'm going to have to make a little hole in the top of the stopper, which is about the same diameter as that, uh, that inside diameter. The main fuel tank also had to be hollowed out, so to speak, as I needed the rocket's fuselage to be completely hollow so it could contain the parachute. Now I had the main components of my design all ready to go, I could select them just like in KSP and put them together. I just used super glue for this as it's nice and strong and also quite brittle. This is a good thing as it means that in a crash the glue would likely give way first so I could use the parts again. I actually discovered this was quite an enjoyable build experience, as the whole process reminded me of building a plastic model kit. Of course, one important job to do was to attach and install the parachute. The decoupler wasn't functional on this rocket, so I had to make an additional functional component that would sit just above it. This part took the form of two 50mm rings that could be held together with two pegs. When glued to the rocket, the friction fit of the pegs kept the nose and fuselage of the rocket together, but allowed them to come apart easily when the ejection charge went off. The rocket weighed in at a surprisingly low 180 grams, so I decided to go with just a single 24 inch parachute rolled up and tucked into the main fuel tube. After this I attached some highly unaerodynamic launch buttons to the side and glued the remainder of the main sub-assemblies together. Fins were cut out from foam board to save weight and glued to the outside of the rocket. With that this first V1 rocket was pretty much finished and ready to be fueled up for its maiden voyage into the unknown. 
So I waited for a gap in the weather and then headed out to my top secret test flight field for a first go. Here's how that went. All right, we're up at the uh, test field. We've got the, uh, the rocket all set up and ready to go. I've got the igniters in. Um, got all the cameras set up, just done a bit of a uh, reconnaissance with the drone just to make sure that the uh, wind speed isn't too high. The sky isn't looking uh, ideal for this uh, test today and neither is the wind. It's a bit windy, it's a bit grey. Uh, the rocket is obviously grey, so yeah, the footage on this, uh, this test flight might not be the best. Sorry about that in advance, but I'll try my best to make it look good for you. I'm getting a bit nervous. <laughs> uh, right, time to plug the battery in. Okay, ready to uh, make the system live. System armed. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. the same problem as the last rocket. <laughs> ah, right, I really need to work on my recovery systems. Uh, okay, let's go and try and find it with the drone again. So, failure or success, it's hard to tell. I mean, it flew and then promptly destroyed itself. So you could argue that it, I did definitely create a successful, authentic Kerbal Space Program rocket that ticks all those Kerbal boxes. Let's quickly analyze what happened. Now, from the flight footage, we can see that the rocket took off fairly straight, cleared the tower, and then tilted over violently to one side. Could this be a case of a typically unstable rocket, or is it something else? Well, I think it's something else. If we scrub back through the footage, we can see that the rocket tracks really nice and straight up to a certain height, and then gets kicked over. Seeing as though the rocket then flies quite nice and straight all the way to its death in the uh, field over there. My conclusion from all of this is that the rocket weather veined into the oncoming airstream, and that the fins were actually doing their job. Right, enough hypothesizing. Let's uh, go back to the VAB and I'll show you how I designed this, the V2. So the new design specification was in place. Firstly, I had to make the new rocket more powerful to increase its velocity and therefore hopefully its altitude to give the parachute time to deploy. For this, I decided to add two more engines that would go either side of the original engine underneath similar fuel tanks. Secondly, I needed to raise the CG to increase the distance between the centre of gravity and the centre of pressure. I did this by adding a couple of smaller fuel tanks in between the nose and the main rocket. Finally, I wanted to add more fins, again in an attempt to make the rocket more stable. It seemed to work well in the game, so I went ahead and printed off the new parts to get started on assembling the V2 in real life. going to see how heavy this thing is. That's 362 grams. Each motor produces about 1.2 kilograms of thrust, of peak thrust. So we've got a power to weight ratio of about 10 to 1. Now we have the V2, it's time to launch it into the sky. Will it work? Will the parachutes deploy this time? Will we get enough altitude for them to deploy, mainly? Or will the whole thing just explode in spectacular Kerbal fashion? Um, there's only one way to find out. Ah, need the launch tower as well. With the rocket complete, I headed up to the field for another test. I'd had to wait patiently for a calm day, but with time running out, the day chosen was regrettably still very breezy, despite the nice blue skies. 10 mile an hour constant winds and big gusts seemed set to spoil the launch. If the broadsided rocket would cope all right in the crosswind was doubtful. I'm not too confident about this launch but hopefully we'll get some more results, even if it uh, goes badly. Also, obviously this is a cluster rocket with three separate engines. Igniting them all at the same time is going to be an important factor. So I'm going to put the drone in the air, I'm going to get the cameras ready, I'm going to get everything else ready and the rocket set up on the pad. Even the drone was telling me that the conditions weren't that ideal. Uh, strong winds. I might have to bring the drone back down, I think. I'm not going to risk it just for this one mission. I lined the drone up at a low altitude behind the pad. Okay. Everything's ready, let's go. Even if the test was a complete fail, I was sure to learn something by going for it anyway. Sometimes you have to throw caution to the wind and simply see what happens. So, that's what I did. Okay, going for launch in five seconds. 
five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Oh no. And it was at this moment I knew I needed bigger fins. Well, that wasn't all that stable. <laughs> oh no. Oh, devastation. That was definitely the most Kerbal launch to date. However, they are largely intact, these pieces, so I suppose I could start again. Reviewing the footage, it's clear to see that the rocket got off to a good start, with all three engines igniting equally. From there on out, though, the rocket simply didn't have the inherent stability to get up to speed where the fins could do their job effectively. The wind knocked the rocket out of its pretty small envelope of stability early on, and it was all over from there. Thankfully, the rocket pitched around a second time to avoid coming down on my head, which would have been, yep, a uh, even worse outcome. <laughs> By the way, I'm not sure if you noticed when you first saw this angle, but it turns out we had a hitchhiker on board who probably wasn't expecting his leisurely sunbathing to end quite as it did. In conclusion, I think this whole project just goes to show how important fins are on small scale rockets when relying on aerodynamics. Bigger fins are certainly better for lower airspeeds, rockets where the CG and centre of pressure are relatively close, and launch days when it's ridiculously windy. <laughs> well, there's obviously a lot to learn. I hope that you really enjoyed these few um, uh, rocket projects that we've been doing on this channel recently. If you're new, of course, please click subscribe if you want to see more stuff in the future um, from this channel and yeah I'll be happy to make more stuff for you. Click the like button on your way out and yeah thank you very very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one.